Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Alicia and I am very thrilled today to introduce to you Curtis Banks. Um, Curtis is someone that I met at the All Black National Convention. That is a wonderful place to socialize, to do a lot of networking, and it's a great place to meet people like-minded. And I'm very happy that I've met a like-minded soul today <laughs> and to have him to talk to you today about um, economic strength, to talk about um, financial trauma, and to also talk about work-life balance. So let's welcome Curtis Banks. And Curtis, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, just a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Hi, Alicia. It is my pleasure to be here. And wow, the event was amazing. It was, it's was. it been my pleasure to meet you and so many other wonderful people at the annual event. My name is Curtis Banks. I am a financial educator, wealth mentor, and award-winning author of the book on money management. Fundamentally, I teach people how money works so that they can get out of debt and live a more fulfilling life with no regrets. Yeah, so um, thank you for that introduction. I think it's like so cool to talk about these topics. It's something that I have totally been into for the past um, while. And um, we had several conversations leading up to today's talk. And one thing that really intrigued me about our conversation is that you talked about economic strength and how having economic strength in the home is definitely related to economic strength in the community, particularly in the black community. So could you speak a little more about that? Yes, uh, this is a very important topic and sometimes it's overlooked for other, other reasons. I recall growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I remember when I was about 10 years old, we used to go about three blocks up to Superior Street. And we'd have barbers, cleaners, um, dry cleaners, and laundry mats, and all the businesses that were right there in that community, we could walk to it. Food, groceries, a bank, all of those institutions and, <clears throat> and businesses were present within blocks of our home. And then you fast forward about 10 or more years and and they the bank disappeared the higher end grocery store disappeared replaced with a low end grocery store the uh, cleaners are gone the restaurants are gone and so you saw a huge migration to the suburbs for many of many businesses and they dried up in the community and if you look at what was going on in the community, we also saw a, a reduction of economic strength in the homes, and it permeated out into the businesses in the local community. So there is a direct connection between economic strength at home, in your home, and what's in your community. And, and they, they tend to be um, in relationship to one another. You lose one and you start to lose the other and they're very tightly connected. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is so important. And um, when I think about some of the clients that I meet with and some of my own life experiences and just all of the clinical work I've done in the past 20 years, it really does kind of boil down to this loss, this loss of economic strength in the home and economic strength in the community. Many of the issues that a lot of people face, yeah, some of it is them, you know, but we can deconstruct some of that and realize, OK, some of it is you. But you know what? Some of it is also structural. Some of it is economic. You know, some of it is um, by design in some way. And so when I'm working with someone one on one, I always like to let them know that, you know, part of it is you. But, you know, also part of it is the system you know, that, that's been given to us and, and giving all of these constraints, how, what are, what are some things that you can do to strategize? And, and also what I like about that is that, um, in that loss that we experience in our homes, because the, if you have, if you're economically weak in your home, you're more likely to have that relationship 
or that marriage or that situation to break apart because there's so many feelings and emotions tied to that. And so with a lot of my clients, there's painful memories related to economics, finances, relationships, all of these things. And so I'm curious about, um, could you speak a little more about the barriers to economic strength related to some of the painful memories or that financial trauma that a lot of us, a lot of us, all of us um, encounter? <laughs> you know, the, the challenge that we have is a big, big challenge. And that is, it's called financial literacy. Yeah. And the idea, is that if you don't understand how money works, then you're likely to be taken advantage of. And that's what we have happening. And, and it's a bigger picture play. Earlier in my career, I didn't understand how money worked very well. And so consequently, I created a lot of debt. I had a great job doing what I love to do. However, what I found is no matter how much money I made, the more I spent and the more debt I created. And I did some research and I began to learn some things about how money worked. And what I discovered along the journey is that 20% of the people in this country have 87% of the wealth. That means that 80% of the people have just 13% of the wealth. Now, that, notice I'm saying wealth. I'm not saying income. And it turns out that wealth is what creates opportunity. <laughs> wealth creates opportunity. So the people who own the dry cleaners and who own the shops that we talked about earlier, they had a measure of wealth. They had a measure of wealth. And somehow that wealth was taken away from them. And what I then began to learn is that over time, what I learned is that there are 7 billion people in the world. And of the 7 billion, 5 billion don't understand how money works around the world. And so when you look at the 80-20 in the US, you look at the stats around the world, I think we have a global impact issue with understanding how money works. And again, what happens if you don't understand how money works, there's somebody, there's that 20% out there that does, and, they're, and they just see it as their job to separate you from your money. Mm -hmm. And it's happening at an alarming rate, and a very alarming rate, when you think about 80% of the people have just 13% of the wealth. Over time, the situation of the, that the 80% have with just 13% of the wealth, and it doesn't matter how much money they make, if they're not creating wealth with it, they're creating debt and expenses. So there are many opportunities for traumatic situations with the 80%. I heard, a, I heard some stats here recently that 50% of the people even with income over $100,000, cannot withstand a $400 emergency. Now that's pretty bad, considering you're making over $100,000 a year, and yet cannot afford a $400 emergency. So there are some, there are many ways that people are experiencing trauma that they are not aware of. And just think about the opportunities for trauma. 80% of the people, just 13% of the wealth. Doesn't matter how much they make. So imagine someone who's making $100,000 a year and get a $400 emergency, and they think about all this money they're making, but they can't come up with $400. There's trauma just built into the scenario. There's stress built into the scenario. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, Curtis, um, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing <laughs> with you, uh, your life and some of the decisions that you've made and the fact that 
Um, you didn't have the literacy that you felt that you need. And by the way, I've been doing a lot of reading on this topic. And um, there's a group of social workers that talk about financial literacy. And they specifically focus on the fact that um, among the African-American community, financial literacy is um, extremely staggering how much African-American community are clueless about finances are clueless about that financial literacy piece which and we all know that drives your decision making and think about all of the wealth that we have all of the money that we have instead of spending that money building wealth we're spending that money building wealth for other people not for our community or for our families so i think that that was really poignant what you talked about um and also, I just wanted to say it's really interesting because some of that, those traumatic experiences that you ex that you have, if you're not able to resolve some of that, if some of it is unresolved, there is a tendency to put your self-esteem because you don't have it in yourself, that self-worth, because that's what happens when you have unresolved trauma. You feel like you're less than because in a lot of different ways, your feelings, your thoughts, your experiences were diminished, right? <laughs> or or yes. these things yes. would happen to you. Um, so what happens is that you start putting a lot of your trust on external. And so for a lot of us, we feel like we have to spend our money on things to feel good because we don't feel good inside already. And so, you know, our self-esteem can be based on, look at all the things that I have. <laughs> look, I have the biggest diamond ring. I have the biggest house. I have the <laughs> nicest car. And that's where I'm putting my self-esteem in. But all of those things, I'm going to be spending money on that and not thinking about building wealth. So I really love what you talked about. Um, and, and, and we spend so much time working so hard when I talk about putting our self-esteem on these material things, what I find that's happening with a lot of families and particularly with a lot of men, so I'm happy that you can speak on this, is that we start putting ourselves into our work where we become workaholics. And it's like, I'm only valuable if I can contribute financially to this family. Although finances we know is important, but that's not the only thing that's important in terms of what you can contribute to your family. You do need to have this work-life balance and in our conversations i thought you had a really unique and pretty awesome viewpoint and perspective could you share with us your perspective on work home life balance because i think everybody needs to hear what you need what you have to say about this well this is really a interesting time to have this topic on the table and i call it daily life balance mm -hmm. versus work-life balance. And the idea here is that you can never balance your work against your life. It just isn't, it's just not, it's not a solvable equation. I, uh, I, have, I happen to have a background in IT uh, technology, have a computer science degree, minor in mathematics, and a master's in management information systems. So I learned a lot about systems and patterns and how things work. And when I think about the equation of work-life balance, it's, it's like your life's over here and your work's over here. And that's not the reality, but that's what they're saying, balancing these two things. So your work is a part of your life. Your work is a part of your life. You can't separate them. No life, no work. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. No life, no work, right? And so, but you can have a life without work. Mm -hmm. You can have a life without work. So balancing those two doesn't work. So what I, uh, what I learned over time is that, and, and got confirmed during COVID, is that there are three areas of life that are, that are extremely important that we all look to balance. And that is, uh, we start with our health. When COVID showed up, the most important thing on the, on the agenda was what? Health and well-being. The second thing that showed up was our work, our career, our income. I call it the personal economy, all right? Our personal economy, my home econ economics because people were concerned about being 
able to go to work. Some some jobs stopped. Some businesses had to stop when they shut down uh, public access, right? And the third is relationships. Mm-hmm. When COVID showed up, people had to stay home, and that didn't last very long because people just were adamant about getting to see family, mm-hmm. going out with friends, going to restaurants, and going to the beach, spring break. <laughs> people weren't standing for this lockdown stuff because relationships are so, so important and the ability to have engagement with people. So those three things, it turns out, are the three things in life to really balance. And there there are three areas within each of the three mm-hmm. that I focus on. So back to well-being, relationships, and my personal economy. And COVID proved those out. That is so, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. Mm-hmm. And so this idea of daily life balance, every day I need to be working on my health and well-being. Every day I have to be working on relationships. Every day I'm working on my personal economy. And so it, what, what I do is I teach a series around this topic where how do you focus on what I call what matters most, right? How do you focus on what matters? And most people aren't tuned into this because they're distracted and focused on other stuff. And and we'll talk about what that other stuff is, but they're not focused on these things. They put more of their time in the things that don't matter and they don't know it. Sometimes they don't know they're doing it and less time on what matters most. So consequently, and this is where I was in the first 10 years of my career. When I share with you, I had a job doing what I'd love to do. I was making more money than my parents, but at the same time, I was spending more and creating debt. Why? Because I was not focused on what matters most. I was distracted and I was spending my money on things that didn't matter. And as I learned more about how money works and what it means to me and how how my personal economy and my health and my relationships are intertwined in a, in a way that that I didn't see it coming. For example, in the first 10 years of my career when I was in debt, living paycheck to paycheck, mm-hmm. my relationship was suffering with my wife. Why was it suffering? Because I was working long hours and because my ends weren't meeting, I started a part-time job. And now I'm away full-time and then I'm away part-time. And we're still having the stress of not making our, meeting our obligations. So I'm stressed out personally, my health and well-being, I'm stressed out. I got bill collectors calling me, telling me how bad of a person I am. My esteem's going down. My self-esteem's going down. And then I'm having these heated conversations with my, my relationship is suffering with my wife, my relationship is suffering with my kids because I'm spending more and more time away. Now, I want you to really tune in to the connectedness between my personal economy, where I was spending my money and creating debt, and my health, my well-being, the stress levels that I'm in, encountering, and how I'm now not able to really perform on my job as well as I could because I'm mm-hmm. dealing with all these financial pressures and these relationship pressures. And now my relationship is suffering between my wife and I, my kids. And and of course it affects other relationships too, but you just can't see it. Yeah. So I began to really tune in on my journey to understanding the nature of these three areas, being in good health, my relationships and my money and my personal economy and how connected they are. That if I had balance around these three areas, that is, I put as much focus on my financial well-being as I do on my job, (laughs) my career, Mm -hmm. because my career was was bringing in significant income. But what I knew to do with money was destroying that potential for wealth and creating havoc in my in my health and creating havoc in my relationships. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I love how all three of those areas, your, when you call, instead of money, you call it personal economy, your health and your relationship, how if you're stressed out in one area, it's going to definitely spill over into the other areas and um, just being distracted, <laughs> the distraction and how you can use money you know, to fuel this distraction. But it, what it does in the short term, it gives you some relief. But in the long term, <laughs> it's really causing way more stress. You know, it's a temporary yes. reliever of stress. But in, down the line, you're going to have to come to terms with that credit card bill is going to come in the mail. You're going to have to pay your bill. <laughs> and, and, um, and so, you know, you have monthly bills that's going to come up. And if it starts piling up, you eventually going to have to like pay the piper, so to speak, literally and, you know, figuratively, of course. And I think that's definitely really cool that you have this enlightenment experience. And I think that what that should tell everybody is that, you know, no matter what your situation is now, I mean, your story is, is a beautiful story because it says you don't have to end there. It's not a total disaster. You can definitely gather yourself up. Part of it, what we talked about was just having awareness, like knowing you're in this situation and it's it's not where you know you need to be, but it's never too late to tune in to what you're doing and what I'm doing. And um, and I think that is so beautiful. And I just really want to thank you for coming on here and talking about this. Um, for everybody out there, I think that um, uh, you probably should know that I've invited Mr. Banks uh, to come on to uh, Dr. Boyce Prime. Uh, we do every couple of Sundays, usually every other Sunday or every couple of weeks on a Sunday night, we'll have financial therapy and we'll talk about different ways in which your personal economy, health, relationships, all of that, how they all are related. And we've been doing a lot of work around healing. We've been doing a lot of work about raising awareness and understanding what that's like for you. So on January 22nd, in the new year, 2023, um, I've invited Curtis uh, to come on and with drboyceprime.com. So if you go there and you join, just go to the website and you'll find everything that you need there. We, I will have him on there on January 22nd, Sunday night, as a special guest to talk a little bit more about um, your personal economy, which I love. I love that term, by the way. I'm going to start using it, your health and your relationship. And before we end today, how about you just let everybody know how to get a hold of you and... Um, and I know you talked about your book earlier, but, you know, give them your website and how to get a hold of you before we end for today. Yes. Well, thank you. And for all who are tuned into this message today, just know that it ain't over till it's over. Yeah. Yeah. And you have an opportunity to make some shifts just like I did. I, I didn't have the understanding of how money works early in my career, but yet I didn't give up. And the only way to win is to stay in the game. Learn how money works, get financial education, <clears throat> hang out with people like Dr. Alicia and Dr. Boyce and myself and learn some of the things that helped us to get better at managing money and creating balance in our lives. And the best way to reach me is curtisbanks360.com. CurtisBanks360.com. And when you get there, you'll see on the front page an opportunity to, to get my book. The book is a summary of my experience, the, the things that happened, what I learned and what I did different to get a better result. And the book is, is filled with ideas and concepts to help you understand how money works. Mm -hmm. And it took 15 years to write. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> it took 15. Why did it take me 15 years? I discovered in my journey that sometimes when you ask people what they did for success, they give you these canned answers. Like I started early, I worked late, and I did what I was supposed to do, da, da, da. Who doesn't do that? But not everybody <laughs> achieves the success. So there had to be more to it. So I began looking for the secret sauce. And the secret sauce is in the book. Excellent. Right. Well, go get the book, learn the secret sauce. 
Um, thank you so much, Curtis Banks, for coming on here. I'm Dr. Alicia, everyone. I'm a therapist and a college professor and all of that wonderful stuff. You can find me at Coaching with Dr. Alicia. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.